Hello, I'm Julia Hanmer, and it's a pleasure and a real privilege to be here with you at the launch of Plant Atlas 2020. And as Kevin has shown, the Atlas demonstrates really deeply concerning declines in the distribution of our native and naturalized plants. And I'm going to talk about why this matters, what action we urgently need to take to reverse these declines, and how the Atlas data can help shape and prioritize conservation efforts. We all rely on plants, from the oxygen we breathe to the carbon they store, the food we eat, the fabric in our clothes and homes, and the basis of many medicines. Plants are our life support systems. And wild plants hugely enrich our lives. They're amazing in their beauty and diversity. And I know I find spending time outdoors amongst trees, flowers and plants hugely enhances my well-being. And there's widespread evidence demonstrating how vital nature connection is to everyone's well-being. Other species, such as insects, bats and birds, also rely heavily on wild plants and the habitats they create for food and shelter. So safeguarding wild plants is fundamental to safeguarding all of our wildlife. And all of this means it's vital that our wild plants can thrive and are valued. Plant Atlas 2020 helps us to understand better what's happening to our wild plants in Britain and Ireland, the substantial declines in their distribution and the urgency of need for action to reverse this change. It also gives us a better understanding of why this is happening, the drivers of change, habitat loss, agricultural intensification, unsustainable land management and climate change. To reverse these declines requires urgent and sustained efforts for nature recovery. And it was good news that the Montreal meeting of the Convention on Biodiversity in December, COP15, agreed a strong framework to guide global action on nature going forwards. However, this will only be achieved if it leads to real investment in action to conserve plants and the biodiversity that relies on them at all national and local levels. So what actions are needed? I'm going to outline five key ones. Firstly, we need to protect the best sites for plants, protect what we've got by strengthening legal protection to conserve and manage these sites in a way that safeguards the most threatened species they were set up to protect. And our Atlas 2020 findings show how far we have to go with this if we're to achieve the COP15 target of at least 30% of land conserved by 2030. There needs to be substantially increased investment, monitoring and enforcement at these most precious sites. Secondly, we need to make more space for nature in the wider landscape. We need to extend, connect, restore and sustainably manage the area of high quality habitat available for plants and other wildlife. And we need to reduce the pressures and unsustainable management of land, soil and water. This needs large projects focusing on key habitats and landscapes with transformation and coordination between managers. And there are examples of successful projects working here, but we need many more of them to achieve the scale of change that's required. Thirdly, we need to ensure that we put plants at the heart of land use decision making. The protection of sites and landscapes combined with sustainable land use helps to reduce negative impacts on plants. However, unless the management of these places is carried out with the requirements of plants in mind, then we'll continue to see population losses, not gains, in overall biodiversity. And considering the needs of plants and planning to manage and restore different vegetation types needs to be central to all nature recovery efforts. Our Atlas 2020 data can help guide land use decisions. One example is red lists. And these provide an assessment of threat based on internationally recognized IUCN criteria. And over the next few years, there's an opportunity for the Atlas data to inform updates to country red lists, which are crucial in helping cons conservation organizations to prioritize and target conservation action. 
These lists rely on high quality information on the distribution of species and the combined knowledge of organisations such as BSBI, working closely with government conservation agencies and partners such as the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, Plant Life, Botanic Gardens and Museums. Another example of how our data can help guide land use decisions is heat maps. Over the past year, we've been working in partnership with Natural England through the Natural Capital and Ecosystem Assessment Programme to develop botanical heat maps. And these are a tool to target positive conservation measures and ensure land use decisions such as tree planting and agriculture cause no harm to species rich open habitats that are important for biodiversity and carbon storage, such as peatlands. And these heat maps were developed to ensure trees are planted in the right place rather than in the wrong places like the ploughed bog in this picture. But they're also can be used effectively in other land use like agriculture and to guide nature recovery efforts. They're currently available for England with a summarised version highlighting high value sites available under open government licence and we hope to extend the approach to other countries in future. The fourth action we need to take is to invest in robust research and monitoring to improve our understanding of how to achieve nature recovery. And the current analysis in the Atlas Summary Reports is the beginning of understanding the changes that have taken place. The wealth of data collected for the Atlas brings many opportunities for further research, including more detailed analysis of the key drivers of change in each country. Alongside this sort of research, it's vital we have in place long-term plant monitoring programmes to track trends in relation to habitats and the key drivers of change. And the National Plant Monitoring Scheme is one good example of such a structured long-term monitoring programme. It's a partnership between BSBI, UKCEH, Plant Life and JNCC. And volunteers survey plant species found in different UK habitats to better understand the abundance and diversity of these species and the health of 11 different habitat types. Finally, we also crucially need to build awareness and appreciation of wild plants. Despite our reliance on plants, they're often overlooked and undervalued. We need to connect people with nature, build awareness and appreciation of the vital roles wild plants play in our daily lives and the threats they face and what we can do to help them. And alongside this, we need to build the skills and continue to share expertise in the study and identification and conservation of plants. So in summary, the Atlas gives us a better understanding of why and how rapidly the distributions of wild plants are changing and highlights some deeply concerning declines. To address these, we need to increase protection for plants, extend the landscapes available to them, ensure our land, water and soil are managed sustainably place plants' needs at the very heart of land use and conservation decision-making and research and monitoring, and build awareness of wild plants and build skills in studying them so that plants and the species that rely on them for food and shelter can thrive. And BSBI science, data and members, the botanists recording wild plants, sharing their knowledge and fostering a love of plants through the Atlas and our wider work, make a unique contribution to the evidence and action needed to ensure wild plants thrive and are valued and to shape and prioritise efforts to conserve them. Thank you.